Hi, I'm Gareth Green and in this video we're going to be having a little engagement with the motets of Yoscan de Pre. Now, who was Yoscan de Pre? Have we ever heard of him? How do you spell his name? Well, let's start with the spelling because there it is there, Yoscan de Pre. And we know that Yoscan was born in about 1450 to 1455, somewhere in that kind of five year window. And he lived until 1521. And he wrote what we know as high Renaissance music. So that's the general background. Some musicologists talk about him as a French composer. Others talk about him as a Franco-Flemish composer. Um, either way, that's how it is. European borders and arrangements have changed a great deal since then. We don't know much about the detail of Yoscan de Pre's life, but he was certainly one of the greatest composers of the Renaissance period. He worked for the King of France and he worked for the Pope. So that's not bad to be able to put those two things on your CV. Uh, and he had a huge influence on European music during the 16th century. So just to get a little bit of a context here, there are a couple of notable composers who came before him. And you may well have come across a guy called Guillaume Dufay. Hang on, let me just do this another way. So oh, we'll get there in a minute. Lovely. Uh, so Guillaume Dufay was one composer who came before him. And uh, the other guy was Johannes Ockegem. So Ockegem. So if you're not particularly familiar with music of this period, there are a couple of key composers who came before him. And then the most significant composer who came after Yoscan de Pre was perhaps a more familiar name, Palestrina. So it just gives you a little bit of a timeline, a little bit of a context. Now, we could get into the life and times of Yoscan de Pre, but to be honest, most of the story we have is speculation. We're very short on detail that can be verified about his life. But we do know there's significant things about working uh, for the King of France and working for the Pope. And there was a pretty significant celebration of his life and his work across the world in the year 2021, which was generally acknowledged to be the 500th anniversary of his death. But one thing is for certain that we do know, Yoscan de Pre wrote a huge amount of music. And really his most significant contribution to musical development was to explore independent movement between musical lines and really to get involved in imitation. You know, if you think about where music had come from by this point, for, for years we'd had single line kind of plain chant music. And then we got into this idea of, well, can we put another line that maybe runs in fourths with the original line? It took us quite a while to kind of get going with independent movement between the parts. It was happening, but by the time we get to Yoscan, we're ready to kind of really get that moving. And he is instrumental in making that happen. So this independent movement between one line and another, they don't have to just walk along at equidistant intervals using the same kind of rhythm. We had started to move away from that, but he really did move away from it big time. And this notion of employing imitation. So what do I mean by that? Well, that's when one part or one voice starts with a melodic idea. And then a little bit later, a second voice comes in and copies it. So it might be exactly the same pitch. It might be at a different pitch, but say, so you have an idea that starts here and goes up a third and then comes down. Maybe a couple of bars later, another voice does the same thing. But maybe the first voice does it starting on C. And then a little bit later, another voice does it starting on G. But it's still what we call 
imitation. It's copying the same idea. So this is a very significant thing that's going on in the music of Yoskan de Pre, and it becomes deeply significant later on. By the time you're looking at the music of Palestrina and Palestrina's contemporaries, you see that uh, imitation is a big deal. Yoskan's music was mainly for voices and he was much more interested than his predecessors were in how the music related to the words. That may seem a kind of funny thing to say these days when we're so often used to songs where the music is kind of painting the words and the emotion of the text and so on. But really before Yoskan, you know, you had words and you just use the words to write music in the main. So the idea that you were trying to think about what the words mean and you were trying to paint that through the music was something that actually people weren't that engaged with. Yoskan started to think that way. So you can already see a lot of significant features in his approach to writing music that don't to us seem amazingly radical, but in the context of Yoskan's age, was pretty radical. Now, previously there'd been a lot of use of melismatic writing. Now, just to be clear what we mean by melismatic writing. That's when you have one syllable, but you have several notes to one syllable. And actually earlier on, before Yoskan, sometimes you went on for a very long time just on one syllable. In fact, you went on for so long that by the time you got to the end of the syllable and moved on to the next one, you weren't quite sure what the original word was in the first place. So, um, you know, these days we do some melismatic writing, don't we? Um, you know, I love you. You see the I is taking several uh, notes up. But if you had a piece of music that went, you get to the point where you think, what is this about anymore? And how does it connect with the words around it? So that wasn't in the style of pre yoskan music, but you get the idea. And that's a good example of melismatic writing. So, um, the trouble with melismatic writing then is it's difficult, isn't it, for the listener to kind of make any sense of the words, to connect one word with the next, to keep track of where we're going with it. It's not something that worried earlier composers, but Yoskan wanted to get hold of that, really. So in other words, the text had simply been there as a starting point to create a piece of music. Yoskan comes along and he's much more interested in writing music that expresses the text in some way. And at times he even becomes involved in word painting. So if you get something like, um, you know, he goes higher, he'll write a rising phrase. So the music actually does go higher to paint that word higher. And then if she comes down, well, then you have a phrase that comes down. So this is the whole notion of word painting. So it's not just sort of clarifying the text by not having too many melismas or too much melismatic writing. So having fewer notes to a syllable, but then also sort of thinking, well, what do these words mean? How do we paint them in the music if we can? That's what we mean by word painting. So. Yoskan preferred to use kind of short, repeated musical ideas that we call motifs, and he'd use those sort of between the voices. Well, as I've already said, Yoskan wrote mainly vocal music. Why was that? Probably because he was a singer himself. And <clears throat> most of his music is written for the church, uh, so he writes masses and motets. Well, motets are kind of anthems. They're, they're bits of music that the choir sings during the service. It may be based on a verse of a psalm or some other biblical text, and it's just sung so that there's some element of beauty being produced by the choir 
for the liturgy and it's a moment for the congregation to reflect on the words, maybe to use it as a kind of stimulus for prayer or silent meditation, that kind of thing. That's what a, a motet is really doing. And masses, well, in the, in the Catholic liturgy, you have these kind of pillars going on during the service, the mass, the communion service. So you have a Kyrie and you have a Gloria and you have a Creed and you have a Sanctus and a Benedictus and an Agnus Dei. They're things that come up during the mass and composers often set these to music. So the Kyrie is translated, you know, the original is Kyrie eleison, Christe eleison, Kyrie eleison. So Lord have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. So it's kind of something that happens at the beginning of the Mass and it's a chance for the congregation to reflect as those words are being sung or maybe just to think about your own week and what's been going on and ask for mercy, for forgiveness, if you like, you know. So that's kind of putting it in the Christian context. So Yoskan's very heavily rooted in this idea of writing motets and Masses that would fit with the liturgy of the church. Now, he wrote lots of other things as well, and he wrote chansons. Well, if you know any French, a chanson is a song, and the chanson would be something that you wouldn't sing in the church. That would be something outside the church, something that's sort of quite a jolly little song. Um, so, uh, just to give you an example of a, a motet, there's a, a motet written for four different voices that Yoskan came up with in about 1480, we think, uh, Domine ne in furore. And it, what he does here is he has one voice that just has a three note motif. And then that motif gets imitated in the other voices. So this is the motif. It's a very simple idea, isn't it? Just really what we would term these days a tonic triad of C major. And he goes from the third to the root to the fifth. And he has this rhythm of one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. So the first voice sings that. Just behind it, the tenors come in and they do this. So you can hear how the tenors are copying that motif that the top voice has started with, but it's not waiting until the top voice has finished. It comes in just behind the top voice and manages to work its ticket alongside the original. Meanwhile, the alto voice comes in, the same motif. So then we get this with the top three voices. So you see how that's all the same three note motif coming with the top three voices. But then the bass line comes in with the same motif. So you get this. So you see how that little simple three note motif gets imitated between the voices. So that's a very typical Yoskan technique and it's very significant for what goes on later. By the time you get to Palestrina, you've got ideas that are often longer than three notes that get imitated in that kind of way. And we really have got what we call polyphonic music. You know, homophonic music is when you're kind of thinking in chords, in other words, organizing things vertically. And a polyphonic music is when you're thinking in lines. It's a kind of linear construction. So you've got one line going, another line coming in, another line coming in, another line coming in. It all has to sort of fit together. So if you like, the kind of resulting chords make sense. But it's all about this imitation. And they're far less interested in chords. They want it to sound right. They don't want it to sound over dissonant but they're thinking about linear construction. Of course, the nice thing about that three note motif that we've just talked about is it spells out that chord. So you can have people imitating that all day long. It's all gonna sound okay because it's all gonna be a C major triad. By the time you get to Palestrina, it becomes even more sophisticated and he knows how to spin a longer line and still make the lines work and keep some harmonic sense in it as well. Well, we could spend some time talking about 
Yoskans masses. There's plenty of wonderful music to explore there. Uh, we could talk about his chansons because they're also absolutely wonderful. But it's true to say that his most significant work really is in the form of the motet, what the English call an anthem, but a motet. And a lot of his motet writing is quite homophonic. It's in block chords and the piece of music on the screen that we're going to be looking at in due course is really pretty homophonic. And when he's writing in that style, he's often writing in a very syllabic way. In other words, one note for each syllable of the text. But then alongside examples like the one we're looking at here, there are plenty of examples where Yoskan is writing a much more elaborate style, uh, contrapuntal, imitative. So the thing that we've just been talking about and describing with these lines, all using this little motif and doing it in turn and copying each other. Um, we see a lot of word painting coming through in Yoskan de Pre that we've already mentioned, particularly when he's setting words from the Psalms. Uh, in the Psalms, you often get very descriptive phrases and he kind of likes working with those. Um, and it's definitely something that became very significant uh, going forwards. Not only in church music, I might say, because there was another important thing that was about to really take off big time. And that was the madrigal, which was kind of unaccompanied uh, vocal music for a small group of singers uh, that was not church music. So what we call secular music. Uh, so that wasn't based on religious texts at all. And that absolutely hugely got into word painting. So what I'm trying to demonstrate here is that um, it's quite interesting to look at uh, you know, what Yoskan was about, but it's very easy for us to think, well, what's the big deal about that? Actually, if I can just try and do this in such a way that points out how significant these things were going to be as music developed through uh, the rest of uh, the Renaissance and then consequently into the Brock, you, you'll see that Yoskan was a pretty significant composer. OK, well, much of Yoskan's motet writing is in four parts, and that had become a fairly standard approach by the mid 15th century. And again, you might think, well, what's the big deal? There's lots of music written for four parts. We have lots of choirs that are sopranos, alto, tenor, bass. So that's kind of what you do, isn't it? Well, when you were alive in Yoskan's day, it wasn't particularly what you did. Um, but he certainly got into, yeah, actually four part writing is quite a solid way to write. And as soon as you're thinking about actually how do we get chords that are fairly full, we're not thinking in major minor keys, any of that stuff yet. We're still thinking in modes, but we're starting to make sense of the harmonic shape of things. And this is something that Yoskan realizes works well in four parts. He also composed motets in five parts and six parts. Uh, and that, of course, that's a, a kind of quite remarkable thing, really, when you think that a lot of music before that had been in fewer parts. So to have a composer who can handle things in five and six parts when there hadn't been a great tradition of that, knowing what to do with it and how to make these uh, imitation figures work and how to keep the harmony together, that's quite something, really. So again, quite significant when you realise that not a lot of that had gone on before. Some of Yoskan's motets are based on something we call a cantus firmus. Um, so cantus firmus, I wonder if you've come across that at all. Cantus firmus. So what's a cantus firmus about? Well, it's the idea of having kind of long notes. Uh, quite often it was originally a, a plain chant line uh, where the, the notes are set in long notes, four beats to each note, for example, and then other things go on around it. So some of Yoskan's motets are based on a cantus firmus, but he does other things as well. He uses canon, you know, when you've just got one line and another line copying the same part behind it, but carrying on copying the same part behind it. So that's not just a little three note motif. That's the whole line being traced um, a few beats behind. 
some use a motif that recurs all the way through the motet. You know, we've talked a little bit about that already. So we're getting the idea that imitation is an important feature. And some of this imitation that we see and hear in Yoskow's motets is almost fugal in design. Now, uh, I say that with reservation because, you know, the minute we start thinking about fugue, we think, oh yeah, there's the subject, there's the answer in the dominant key, here's a counter subject, we've got episodes, we've got uh, the initial exposition, the middle section, the final section. I'm not suggesting for a moment that he's doing anything as sophisticated as that. That's all going to come later. What I am suggesting, though, is that Yoskan starts to do things that sow seeds in the direction of the fugue. You know, it's quite interesting. You know, we quite often start our musical studies in the Baroque. I mean, that's great, and I love the Baroque, um, but we sometimes are a bit vague about what happens before it. So we think about, oh, fugue, Bach wrote 48 preludes and fugues, you know, great, let's have a look at these fugues. But where did that come from? And we kind of sort of know that, well, yes, people like Palestrina and Bird and Lassus and Vittoria um, had been writing imitative music. So I suppose that leads to fugue. But we need to go back just a little bit further. And then we see in Yoskan's motets, there's, there is something that's a little bit fugal in design. Um, so one of his motets, Ave Maria, for example, he does that. It starts off with something that you've got a slightly kind of um, clearer motif that almost looks like a fugue subject and then it's imitated and things are happening at different pitches and so on. So he's beginning to sow some fugal seeds. I think that's the, the best we, we can put it really. Before Yoskan though, composers didn't really tend to set their psalm texts polyphonically, this idea of setting things in lines. So but that became a real hallmark for Yoskan. He was really into this polyphonic thing, this linear setting of the psalm text. And, and so the psalm text became a big feature of his motets as he went, particularly later on. There's some quite famous settings of motets that Yoskan did. You might want to have a listen to his Miserere, for example, his setting of Psalm 51. Lots of composers have set that, but Yoskan did that as a rather, rather glorious setting. Um, he did a couple of settings of Psalm 130, De Profundis. You might want to have a listen to that if you can find that. Um, but Yoskan also wrote motets in a kind of hybrid style. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, really, it's a kind of fusion between his motet writing and his chanson writing. Now, that might have been a bit of a shock to some of the church authorities at the time. You know, the idea that you've got this pure motet that's there to glorify God. And then we've got this chanson thing going on, this sort of song that you sang down the local pub, you know, and how on earth do you fuse those two things together? Well, Yoskan did a little bit of that, which is quite interesting. And it's really based on uh, developments that were going on at the time in Milan. And so it became known as the motet chanson. And during the 15th century, music had been composed in what was known as the form fixe style. I'll just make a note of that because that's another term that you might want to research further. The form fixe style. And the form fixe style was kind of used entirely in secular music, in non-church music. And so Yoskan had this kind of idea of trying to write motet chansons that had a Latin sacred text, so that was a, a church text, um, with a cantus firmus singing the Latin text in the lowest of maybe three voices. And at the same time, the other voices would sing a secular French text. I mean, it may seem a kind of mad idea. You've got this bottom line singing this religious text in long notes as a cantus firmus, and then you'd have another couple of voices above that singing in a different language in French, singing something that was secular, that wasn't religious at all. Um, but 
the secular text was not meant to be something that he was trying to bring into the church in some dishonorable kind of way. It was a text that somehow related to the Latin text, which I think is really very interesting. So you've got your Latin text and then you try to find a secular text in French that is kind of a bit of a commentary on it or relates to it in some way. Quite clever when you think about it. So he writes these uh, three part um, motet chanson. So you get this funny thing where you've got a bit of Latin in the title and a bit of French in the title. So things like que vous madame slash in pace. So you've got the Latin in pace, in peace, and then you've got a French que vous madame going on above it. It seems a kind of fairly crazy idea, doesn't it? Um, but, but there we are. Uh, very skillful stuff that he managed to do when you think about what had gone on before. Yoskan brought something that was far more sophisticated. And so Dufay, Okagem before him, very significant composers, the topic for another occasion. Uh, and they're, they're making big strides forwards. But Yoskan really kind of gets hold of these threads that we've talked about and sets the, the scene, if you like, for Palestrina and his contemporaries to come along and develop things even further with this imitation and so on. And then we move forwards from there into uh, the whole counterpoint of the Baroque. So just a kind of giving you a little bit of context. Now, we've done a lot of talking there, but it'd be good just to sort of think about a piece of music, wouldn't it? So this piece of music I've got on the screen is just the, the first bit of one of these motets by Yoskan de Pre. So let's have a listen. I haven't put the words in, of course there are words for this, but just to get the flavor of this piece. And so it goes on. Now it's very tempting when you hear that to think, well, it doesn't sound that marvelous. And uh, you might even listen to that and think, well, I think I could write better harmony than that. Why did he use this chord instead of that chord? You have to get yourself into the right time zone because we are going back a very long time here. Uh, so it's easy to look at this stuff with hindsight and think, well, it's not that good, is it really? But actually, it's quite remarkable for its day. So remember, we're going back now, aren't we, to the late 1400s. Music is still modal. We haven't got anywhere near thinking about major and minor keys. Although you might notice an interesting thing in this score here, that we've got this, for example, what's called musica ficta. When we're writing in a mode, but every now and again, a composer might be thinking, should I just kind of raise that note? So when you look at this without the ficta, in other words, without that, it sounds like this. But they might have done it like this with a G sharp. And you might say, oh yeah, that sounds much better. It sounds much better because we're then experiencing that in a kind of a minor tonality uh, rather than a, a, in, a, in a mode. And this is what happens, of course, as we go. We're, we're working in the modes. We start to use this musica ficta, putting in the old sharp or flat somewhere because it sort of sounds slightly better on the ear. And that's the thing that starts the erosion of the modes and will lead us eventually in the early 1600s to establish major and minor tonality. So at the moment, that's just a sign of things to come, which is quite interesting. But remember, even though I've picked something here that's pretty homophonic. In other words, it's going from one chord to the next, isn't it? Uh, you can see it's kind of constructed top to bottom or bottom to top, whichever way you look at it. It's not really these imitative lines that we were talking about earlier, all going in kind of block chords. Um, but you can see 
we've got quite a bit of stability haven't we just repeating that chord it kind of gives it a sort of solemnity doesn't it okay and then we move on to another chord we slightly rearrange the same chord a little bit of rhythm at the top there so there's just something happening and then as we go into the next phrase it just starts to get a little bit more interesting from the rhythmic point of view so much more kind of engaging rhythmically and a nice contrast with this homophonic opening phrase you also notice there are things sort of going on like you might have noticed here there's a a suspension it's prepared at the end of this bar this measure here it's sounded here and resolved there what we call a four three suspension because that tenor is a fourth above the bass note e and that g is a third so it's a four three suspension there and so little techniques like that going on you notice you know you've got this idea of even though this is not particularly imitative we've got here the top and the bottom parts kind of working together they're kind of going down there aren't they with the same rhythm and then we've got another one of these suspensions here do you see it's prepared here and then it's another one of these four three things going on here but in the middle you know we've got this kind of quite free flowing tenor part and then the alto part has a little rest and then comes up with this idea and this idea is the inversion of this idea that had previously been used so you see how he's kind of using these little motifs in a slightly different kind of way and there's a sort of sense of cadence isn't there you know you get to the end of this and you think well that's not any kind of cadence we recognize but we're coming to the end of something and we're settling there's a much clearer cadence here it's almost a kind of perfect cadence isn't it and you notice again because this note is sustained we end up with another four three suspension going on there so some interesting things going on in the harmony then it becomes more homophonic again but there is this sort of passing note thing going on in the in the alto part there and then we've got this sort of quite interesting thing here where you've got these repeated e and g and it's part of what we would know as an e minor chord but it's also part of what we would know as a c major chord so he starts off with this e minor chord but by the time he gets here he's changed it to a C major chord. So the idea that you can repeat notes, but change the color of the music by finding another chord that's got the same notes in it. Anyway, it's kind of looking at that in terms of what was going on before Yoskan, and I hope I've painted a little bit of a picture of that, but it's thinking about where's this all going? So if you kind of know a little bit of music from what happens next, you'll recognize many things that are emerging in the music of Yoskan de Pre. So this is kind of like, you know, a thumbs up for Yoskan de Pre, if you like. You know, you can look at this music without thinking of its context and think, what's exciting about this? When you realize its context, you think, actually, he's pretty significant and it's quite exciting music. So there's no substitute for going away from here and listening to the motets and the masses and the chansons of Yoskan de Pre and just getting a kind of feel for the style and maybe as well just connecting with some of these bonds like Guillaume Dufay and Johannes Ockergem um, just so you've got the kind of well what happened before this because I find that most people's knowledge of music pre-baroque is a bit hazy understandably and the further back you go the more hazy it becomes so it's just a bit of an invitation to think well let's let's engage with this stuff and and see what's going on so i hope that's been a helpful introduction to Yoskan de Pre and his motets in particular well if you've enjoyed this video do go to our website, which is www.mmcourses.co.uk. And when you get there, uh, you'll find lots of exciting material that will help empower you on your musical journey. One route you can go down is to click on Maestros on that home page, because Maestros is our very exciting 
global musical community that's absolutely rooted in music matters. And there are three levels of engagement. And I say they're levels of engagement, not levels of ability. So don't immediately think, oh, I can't possibly be good enough to do this. It's open to everybody. And level one is a kind of uh, support level, if you like, but it comes with various perks and you get emojis and all these exciting things. Um, and you get some early access to some of our material, which is something you may be interested in. If you uh, want to move up to level two, you have all the benefits of level one, but level two brings more benefits, including access to a monthly live stream where you can join me each month where I do a solid one hour teach and we have a live chat running so you can ask questions, make comments, you can request topics for future live streams, you can kind of uh, interact with other members of the group. Lots of people find that incredibly helpful because lots of people are kind of on a bit of a lonely musical journey and they suddenly realise, oh, there are other people out there doing the same as I am and maybe having the same successes and the same struggles. So that's a kind of deeply encouraging thing. Then there's level three. And again, if you join level three, you have all of the level two and the level one benefits as well. In level three, you get discounts off our courses, for example. You also have access to a second live stream each month. And in this one, we're focusing it much more individually. So if you're a composer and you want to submit the score of a work that you've written or that you're working on, you want some advice, some feedback, well, you can do that. Actually get that one-to-one -one feedback. If you're a performer and you want to submit a recording of something you're working on for some feedback, you can do that. So that's the idea of level three. And we share all this in the group, uh, which is done with deep respect for each other. So don't panic about that at all. Uh, and we can all learn from each other, from, from the feedback that we get. And other people will throw in their comments on what they think. And that's just giving us further insight into the whole thing. So I do recommend Maestros to you. Have a, have a good think about whether that would be something that's useful to you. And if you join Maestros, you immediately have access to all of the previous Maestro live streams that we've done. So there's a huge bank of material there that might be of interest. If you're thinking, actually, courses might be the thing that I want to go for, go back to the homepage, click on courses, and you'll find that we've got over 20 courses out there on all sorts of aspects of music, from theory to harmony to oral work to analysis to orchestration. It's all there. And these are very different from the YouTube uh, videos that we do because these are structured courses, A to Z courses, where you can really work through a structured program and, and absolutely tool up in something that you want to really develop your skills in. So anyway, have a look there. It's all there, www.mmcourses.co.uk.